Welcome everyone to another week at the Global Sports Channel. It's the football show with my pals Mike Sutton and Darren McCauley. Uh, first of all, guys, thank you for uh, coming back and joining once again. It's going to be a fun-filled episode covering teams that we love, our teams, Leeds, Arsenal and Man U, and of course the rest of the Premier League action. Uh, first up, Darren, right now playing for St Albans Dynamo right there in Australia. Of course, I know you, uh, especially my brother knows you from the coal rain days in Northern Ireland, Derry, Inverness, and I know you were a trainee with Celtic United as well. Thanks for coming on again, once again, Darren. Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks for having me, David. And I would say pals is probably too strong a word. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. As okay. a Leeds oh. fan, as a Leeds and Man United fan, you know, maybe acquaintance. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it at that. But you know what? Let's see. Let's see how the week treated us. I think I can call you pal because the week was kind to all three of our teams, I think, overall. Especially your, your team, Darren, had a great week. And welcome yeah. him back once again, uh, my mate, pal, I'll say whatever I want, I guess. That will be Mike Sutton, president of his local Surfside Waves, just celebrating their 25th year anniversary last week. Also, a lifelong Arsenal fan, as you can tell by his retro jersey, and owner of many businesses, including the Auckland Huskies. Welcome back, Mike. Good to see you, buddy. Thank you, David. I think it's fair you can call me brother by now. Um, That's but, great. Uh, we'll see how this show goes, if that uh, title can remain. Of course, uh, um, you know, we're all bit of rivals on this show and we're all fighting for, well, you and I are fighting for 10th or 11th, which is, as we know, sheep stations. And um, Darren's just drifting around in no man's land, really unattached to anything. So let's go. Let's go. Well, you know what? I think uh, I think all of us are going to be feeling pretty good. I think the run of form going into the last part of the season is going to be good for all three teams. First up on Wednesday was an absolute demolition by Man City at home to Southampton. It was a 5-2 win for Man City, continuing their absolute domination over the last 20 games or so. It was actually um, tied up. In the 25th minute, after James Ward-Prowse perfectly executed a penalty, he had equalised after Kevin De Bruyne had scored his first goal in the 15th minute. He got a brace, scoring also in the 50th, 59th minute. But a brace from Mares, as well as one of our favourite players, right, Darren, Gundogan, got on the scoreboard once again. I don't know if we don't need to spend much time on this one because Man City... Even when you're in the game, you think you're tied up. You thought, hey, you know what? We're in this game, but you're not really in the game. They've got so much on the bench. Aguero on the bench, Mendy on the bench. I mean, they've got so many options that literally when they make those changes, they've still got four or five deadly strikers up there. Um, we know they're going to finish in first place. Let's move on from that. Next Wednesday, uh, sorry, the, the game's next uh, up were on Wednesday, and that was the Champions League games. First, Liverpool needed to get some confidence back. They did that. They beat what's been a decent Leipzig team in the domestic leagues in the Bundesliga. Leipzig has played really well. They were convincing victors in the second half, but it was also played for in the first half, it was nil and a half time, but Salah and Mane put it away, scoring in the 70th and 74th minute. Whew. I don't know, Liverpool. Um, what do you think, guys? Darren, um, convincing enough to get back on track? Or do you think that uh, Leipzig just wasn't their day? What do you think? No, I think Liverpool were convincing winners. They just had a bit too much for Leipzig. And I think the Champions League is going to be a could be a saving grace for Liverpool and for Klopp. You know, um, they have that bit of pressure in the Premier League. Um, all eyes are on them. So it looks to me as if the Champions League is going to be um, the place where they'll have most success. I think I agree with you. Um, I, I think it's going to be tough, though. If you look at the opposition, um, 
Well, Bayern Munich still left. Man City, uh, gosh, I mean, PSG is dangerous. Um, I mean, there's so many dangerous teams left. I just don't think they're going to have enough to get to go all the way, in my opinion. What do you think of that, Mike? Do you think they've got enough to go all the way in the Champions League? No, I don't. Um, I, ho- I kind of hope they do because I've really enjoyed watching that Liverpool team um, and Klopp, especially over the last four years. And, uh, you know, they've, they're not the Liverpool sort of of old. Um, it really rejuvenated the club and the, the vibe and the way they play and their a- attitude and atmosphere of, the, of, of, you know, the side. Um, and, you know, it's good for from an, as an Arsenal fan to see them dip this year. We know why, of course. But you know, I hope they're up there. But yeah, they don't have the they don't have the depth. I don't think to make it all the way. Yeah, I don't think they do either. Um, man, Lewandowski for Bayern, man, they, they look dangerous up front every time he gets the ball. He is just absolutely lethal. But talking about other teams in the Champions League, uh, interesting game next up was uh, PSG against Barca, and it was a one-all draw. Of course, the two main figures that we love. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure we should use the word love, but respect, I think, in general, is Mbappé, of course, for PSG. He scored via a penalty. And, of course, Messi on the board once again. Hasn't been a great season for Messi. He started to, start, started to score more in the last few games. I predict that PSG will be in the mix in the final four uh, of the last team standing in the Champions League. We'll see about that now. Let's move on to the Europa League. And up were both of your teams featured. First up was Man U at home to Milan. I thought it was a very good game. I thought Milan had more offensive chances in the game than Man U. And surprisingly, you made a change at half time and brought Traore on. And he ends up scoring in the 50th minute only for a heartbreaking equaliser by Simon Kiyar in the second minute of added time right before the end of the game. We'll go to you first, Darren. Uh, you're the Man U supporter. You're a lifelong fan. Um, you think uh, Man U got a little bit lucky in this one or you think they deserved at least a point in this one? No, I think they deserved at least a point. And Milan... I think Milan, they didn't have any clear-cut chances, but they worked hard, stayed in the game and got their goal. They're missing Ibrahimovic, and sure. his presence is a huge loss to them. Um, I was actually looking forward to seeing him back at Old Trafford. Um, but I think United deserved to win the game, um, but it will be a different story with Ibrahimovic in, in Italy, in the return leg. Yeah, he's been absolutely uh, uh, rejuvenated. What is he, 35 right now, uh, Ibrimovic? Uh, I think he's older. He might be older, David. Is he? Is he older than 35? Yeah. He's 30, 38 or something. 38 or so, he's, yeah. He's, he's, quite, he's, he's quite old. It is amazing that this year, this season, he's really rejuvenated in that Milan team. And look where they are in the league in Serie A. They look... Really tough team to play against, and that would be the difference maker when he gets obviously back in the side. Mike, did you see the game? I know you don't want to spend much time talking about Manu. Any comments? Uh, not really. I think that, it, like Darren said, it's a different game in Italy. Um, they deserve to draw, you know, no, no doubt about it. Uh, it's shaping up to be a nice little competition, this uh, Europa League, isn't it, at the moment? Um, some interesting things going on. Um, that's an interesting story about Abramovich. You heard that, you know, he, he's known as the lion, right? Everyone knows that, self-professed. Uh, when he was at school, when, the, when he used to misbehave, the teachers used to give themselves the detention because they were so scared of him. Well, he was, uh, I mean, look at the size of him. I'm sure when he was young, you know, uh, as tall as he is and imposing as he is, yeah, they probably ran and hid. But let's move on to your team, Mike Arsenal 3-1 winners away at Olympiacos. Uh, Well, good performance overall, man. You had lots of shots on goal, 12 shots on goal, eight on target. Odegaard, who's turning out to be one of my favourites in your side. I think he's a hard-working player. Gabriel in the 79th minute after El Rabi had actually, El Rabi had actually tied it up for Olympiacos. He got a bit nervous there 
for Arsenal. But Mo Elneny came back in to the side and scored in the 85th minute, which was a bit of a surprise. Your take on the game? Arsenal definitely, I thought, deserved this, especially with their second half performance. Yeah. Yeah, I think we definitely deserved it. Um, you know, great, great first goal. I was thinking at the time, geez, where this guy is, is you know, he's, he's hit, missed a few passes. You could see some of his colleagues getting a bit frustrated. He wasn't reading their play. Um, Bellerin, I think, down, down the right was getting a bit upset. And then he's pulled off an absolute belter and, you know, the game <laughs> changes. So you can't, you can't take that away from good players. Good game. Happy to be through. Tough, tough over there. Hopefully get the job done and, you know, march on. Yeah, you're still in it. Uh, Darren, you see the game. Uh, you probably, like Mike, watching Man U games, you probably don't watch many of the Arsenal games. And if you do, it's probably uh, you feel like you're being tortured. But what was your take on the game, you know? I didn't see the game, um, but you're right. I wouldn't be one to tune in for Arsenal. I would watch them uh, with respect to this show. Um, but it's not something I would go out of my way to watch, and specifically not a Europa League game. But uh, good experience for Arsenal because they're a young team, so to progress in European competition is always beneficial. And El Nene is a blast from the past, really. he's yeah. We've hardly seen him, and I think he, he signed maybe around five years ago, so um, Egyptian international as well. So, um, yeah, probably good for him to, to come back and score, but... Um, doesn't pique my interest, no. Well, let's move on. Now, you in the next... Darren, this is for you, Darren. In the next game, the last game I want to feature real quick, just a quick thing, not going into much of the game, is Dynamo Zagreb, which is, I, I believe, St. Albans Dynamo is affiliated with Dynamo Zagreb. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. They're like... Um, they have a lot of connections with the club and the badge and... Uh, is kind of modelled off Zagreb. Yeah, well, they were up and they were playing away at Spurs. Spurs scoring twice through Harry Kane, a Harry Kane brace, which is a familiar term for us. And Spurs go on to win that one. So unfortunately, Dynamo Zagreb lost that game. But let's move on to Friday. And the one game on Friday was Newcastle, Aston Villa. Wasn't a bad game. Um, it looked like it was going to be a bit of a, a, a tense ball draw until an absolute belter of a header from Ollie Watkins, but it was actually put down as an official own goal with Surin Clarks scoring an own goal in the 86th minute, but an absolute bullet of a header from Watkins and it goes in off Surin Clark. Only for Jamal... Laskells to equalise in the 94th minute. So surprising, Aston Villa, like we talked about last week, guys, inconsistent team. If they really want to start finishing in the top eight, they need to finish off these games. They're dropping points against poor teams, but beating top sides like earlier in the season when they beat Liverpool 7-2. Saturday, another surprise was Burnley beating a top side in Everton 2-1, ex-lead striker Chris Wood, New Zealander, Kiwi, scored in the 15th minute. Dwight McNeil made it 2-0. And then, of course, Calvert-Lewin pulled one back for Everton, but it stayed that way. Burnley is one of these sides where I thought that they were slipping towards the bottom three. I'm convinced their recent run of form will put them enough points on the board to keep them away from the bottom three. Next up was Man City. This goes to Saturday's games. They were 3-0 convincing winners away at Fulham. Now, Fulham, we've been speaking lately that we thought that they've got back into a run of form to get them out of the bottom three. But again, John Stones with an absolute bullet of a header. Gabriel Jesus and Aguero coming back, finally scored his first goal. I think they said something like a year and a half since he scored. Uh, so to welcome Sergio Aguero back into on the scorer's table or the scoring, uh, uh, basically the, the goal scoring form, rediscovering that is something that Man City for the future will welcome. He's in his mid thirties. I know now Sergio Aguero, that wasn't a surprise. Saturday saw Crystal Palace 
Winners 1-0 at West Bromwich Albion. That was Mili Vojevic, and he scored a penalty in the 39th minute. Saturday's first game, however, and this is the first feature game I want to talk about, my side, Leeds United, the Whites, in what I thought was a very entertaining game, <clears throat> by the sound of it, a nil-nil draw, you might not think that this was an entertaining game to watch, but both sides had chances, mostly Leeds United. Um, there was a terrific, a terrific shot by Tyler Roberts that the keeper, Mendy, managed to push onto the bar. I thought was a terrific chance for Leeds, and Leeds had a few chances, but ultimately it was a it was a nil-nil draw. Take on the game, guys. Did you see the Leeds? Chelsea game, your impressions of the game overall. Let's go to Mike first. Yeah? Um, never has there been a more one-eyed host of a show because you glossed over the Fulham 3-0 loss, which was a really great game. It was nil all at half time. And um, typical, as we've discussed all the time, you can, you can be you can be drawn to you can be equal to the 97th minute and they'll still win 3-0. And that's what happened in that game. Good game. And you've gone straight to your team, which I don't blame you for. I'm just making, just giving you a bit of a jab there, mate. Um, I can take yeah. it. It's well, 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 well taken. Well taken. Uh, continue. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well taken free kick from just outside the box, Dazza. Um, yeah, interesting game. You know, Chelsea, they are a completely different unit as we keep talking. I think that um, you haven't seen, has there been another nil all Leeds game this season with any other team? Um, I'm thinking that was our third draw of the season. Not nil all, though. And I don't think, I think that was the first yeah. one we hadn't scored in, yeah. And I think that comes down to the steeliness and the efficiency that Chelsea have in their, in their system now um, under Tuchel. Tuchel, Tuchel. Um, okay. And, okay. you know, any other team may have, may have copped a couple there from Leeds. But, yeah, interest, really good game. Yeah, I thought so. Um, I think Leeds may have had the more clear-cut chances. Um, what did you think of the game, Darren? Um, I think it was probably yeah. a deserved yes. one-all draw, you know, or maybe a, a nil-nil draw, but one uh, should have been one or, one or two, I think, each year. I think Chelsea uh, dominated as usual and what? Prob probably deserves to win, but uh, the, the effort from Roberts and Rafinha had a chance as well. Leeds are always going to create, no matter what, no matter how defensive they well set up a team are. Um, but again, just impressed by Chelsea. Um, thought they, I thought they would have scored, but from a Leeds point of view, happy that they, they, that they didn't concede, because it's not often we say that about Leeds. Yeah, now to your point about Leeds not conceding, they've given up, um, I think, the second most goals in the league um, with the exception of West Bromwich Albion. So that is a fair stat. I think having D Diego uh, Lorente back, since he's come back from injury, he's made some mistakes, but they've literally cut down on the amount of goals they're giving up in the last couple of games with him in the side. You give him a few more games at the back. And I think once we get Robin Koch, who is the German young international at centre-back, who is back in training, I think will be good. Uh, we're looking forward to the summer transfer market, and I think uh, it will be full steam ahead for Leeds. But let's move on, guys, to Sunday's game. Southampton were surprisingly 2-1 losers once again. To up and down team Brighton and Hove Albion, Lewis Dunk puts Brighton Hove Albion up in the 16th minute. Shea Adams with an I don't know if you guys saw this, but Shea Adams with an absolute thumper of a volley to equalise in the 27th minute, and uh, Trossard with the 56 minute winner, Brighton and Hove Albion. Um, earlier in the season, Southampton looked like. When they were leading the uh, division, they were top for the first several games and they were in first place and they were unbeaten, I think, in, the, in five games in a row. Um, they've really 
seen this absolute decline. Is that because the injuries to Danny Ings, he came back in the side, now he's out again. It was Lewis Dunk up front. Southampton, do you think they're going to finish in the bottom three? Or do you think uh, they're too, too strong a side once they get some healthy bodies back? Let's go to Darren on this one, yeah? I think Southampton are in very dangerous territory. Um, it's it's really if they survive, I'll not be surprised. But if they get relegated, I'll not be surprised either. They're in a really vulnerable position. Um, with regards to the game, it was a bullet header by Lewis Dunk, and it I, it's not that Danny Ings. Um, Southampton are doing worse because Danny Ings is missing because Shea Adams has came in, and I think that's three and three now for him. Yeah, he looked um, great. So he's came and he looks great. He's doing a great job. So defensively, they do concede a lot of goals. So that's where they're leaking a lot of goals at the back. And and a team that does that is always in a position to be relegated. Yeah, fair assessment. Would you agree with that, Mike? Uh, they're leaking too much at the back, even though they've got some promise up front with people like Shea Adams. Mike, you there? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, yep. Yeah. We've yes, got you fro frozen, frozen screen. There you go. Any comments on the yes, uh, Southampton? Do you think they're going to uh, stay up, or you think they may fall into the bottom three before the end of the season? Well, yeah, I mean, there's six points in front of third, uh, third bottom. Um, they've become the team not to watch almost, haven't they? Um, yep from a very bright start to the season, as you mentioned. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, I think Darren's right. They're in a bad place. Yeah, let's move on. Um, I think well done to Brighton Hove Albion uh, for a team that was in the bottom three earlier in the season. Brighton, I think, surprising a lot of people up front. And they do have Danny Welbeck and, and uh, also Adam Lalana to go to on the bench as well. Sunday came around and it was... An absolute demolition in the second half. Leicester 5-0 over Sheffield United, who, what an absolute pathetic start for Paul Heggenbottom, who we know from Leeds United because he was a Leeds United manager under Massimo Cellino, the manager eater. Um, yeah, I don't know why they picked Heggenbottom. Um if you're going to take Chris Wilder out of the managerial position and make a change, why the heck do you go with Heckenbottom? Absolutely pathetic. Four, four goals in the second half. An absolute cracker of a hat-trick, especially the third one by Kelechi Iannaccio. I thought he was terrific. I thought Vardy on a couple of the assists was absolutely phenomenal. Vardy... I thought wrapped it up to make it five, but it was it was counted as an own goal. And Ayos Perez with the other goal for Leicester City. Um, this is classic Leicester City. Great on the counter-attack. And when they're on, they're devastating finishers. And when they're off, they lose to a crap side. Um, just one comment. Are, they, are, they, are these guys mad at Sheffield United? Replacing Chris Wilder at this stage in the season with Paul Heckingbottom, have they got this wrong or are they just already thinking about next year? And I think if they are thinking about next year, they pick the wrong guy. What's your take on that, Darren? Yeah. Well, we never know what's going on behind the scenes, but um, I see where you're coming from to, to replace Wilder with um, someone who doesn't have that Premier League experience and doesn't have the experience of keeping teams in the Premier League um, is a strange one. Um, if they're going to get relegated, then getting relegated with Wilder, I think, gives them more stability to come up the following year if the the people, the players that be, have that patience. But, but if you're going to replace a manager at this stage, usually you're going to bring in someone with a strong pedigree. Um, no disrespect to to Paul Heggenbottom, but he doesn't have that experience that you would expect a Premier League manager to have. I agree with you. And I think, listen, the fans in the North, uh, being a Leeds fans, fans in Yorkshire, uh, they can get a bit impatient. I, I think you needed a stronger 
man manager in my mind, um, somebody similar to a Chris Wilder that, as you said, had some experience. Um, and Chris Wilder's proven from every single layer of the divisions, from the second division to the you know to the championship, he's moved teams up. And I think he would have been better to stick with him and uh, at least started next season with him. What's your take on that, Mike? Do you think this was a, a, a poor decision from the board at Sheffield United? Um, well, ultimately, the, the, the replacement choice isn't great. Uh, I think there's a bit of backstory here where uh, Leeds, uh, sorry, Sheffield have said that they would never sack Wilder given the relationship, given the, the lifelong commitment to the club and how he's got them to where they are now. Um, and I'd say that the, the, the story read that he was, it was by mutual consent. Oh, wow. So I think that Chris Wilder has done the honourable thing for the sake of the fans, more so than maybe what's best for the club next year or moving through that. Um, you may see him back. I think they're obviously planning for next year and get, just getting past this year. I don't think you'll see that coach coaching next year. Yeah, I agree with you. Let's move on. And the other games coming up, we had a really good game. Uh, let's go out um, to the next game, which was Arsenal. Your team, Mike, I thought it was a great game. Arsenal, 2-1 winners away from home in the London derby against Spurs, who, to me, were very poor on the day. Gareth Bale shouldn't have even been on the pitch. He was absolutely pedestrian. He was disinterested. It was like we were talking about him when I was slagging him off a few games ago when he was at Madrid. He was just sulking when he came off. He didn't seem like he wanted to be there. And yet, I've got to give him credit for the last few weeks. He's actually looked fantastic. Lamella, the no way Spurs deserve to be... Uh, ahead in this one. But Eric Lamella, one of the best goals I've seen, how he got that angle and to, to, to poke it right into the right corner through the legs of the Arsenal defence. Uh, what a goal that was. It was a sucker punch for Arsenal because they had dominated. They hit the post, what, two or three times in the game. But Odegaard with the leveller in the 44th minute and Lacazette with the penalty. Take it away, Mike, on this one. Your impression of the game, I thought this was a really entertaining game, but Spurs were very poor. Well, thanks, Dave. I have to disagree with you. I thought Spurs were absolutely sensational at the top what? of their performance in all levels. And it just shows, it just goes to show you how um, awesome Arsenal actually are because they've overcome a team that played out of their skin and blew them away. Of course, I'm being facetious. Yeah, I, I agree that. The, the Lamella goal, what do they call it? A Robono, Des? I think that's what they call that. Yeah, uh, incredible, yeah. Yeah, incredible goal. I mean, that's the that's the goal at every kid on any park anywhere in the world. Yep. During, during, you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the type of goal that every coach is trying to tell their kid, you don't score them during a game, stop practicing. Um, great, great team performance by Arsenal. I think, you know, Penalty here or there, you know, there's a bit of a bit of a controversy over that. But at the end yeah. of the day, we just I think we were deserved winners. We played with great flair and attacking. Um, you know, well coached in, in the way we, we managed them going down. They actually took control of the game when they went down to ten men. Um, and I think you often see That's that you know, the wounded ball that uh, they it settled them down and upset our rhythm more than anything. But you know, absolutely delighted to get one over our our North London, London rivals. Yeah, you were dominant, especially down the left-hand side in the first part of the game. And they just had a hard time dealing with you on that left side. And um, yeah, I thought Arsenal, when they went behind, I thought they should have been 2 or 3 nil up, but deserved winners. You had to see this game, Darren. Don't tell me you didn't see this one. I thought it was a good game. No, it was a very good game. To be fair, Arsenal thoroughly deserved they won the game. They dominated possession. Tottenham scored against the run of play, which was a fantastic goal by Lamella. That Rabona was just exceptional. I was shocked when I seen it. Um, <laughs> but he has he has that in his locker because when he was at Roma, he's done that a few times. He just hasn't really produced it in the Premier League. Um, a huge injury concern is Son. He pulled up with a hamstring injury. Yeah, I saw um, 
yeah, Beale, you know, didn't play well, had a good free kick towards the end, but Arsenal dominated. Uh, Spurs scored against the run of play. Uh, Odegaard with a good goal, and uh, like I said, with the with the penalty then, and Lamela silly sending off from Lamela then, he, very silly. Yeah, I think a stupid sending off there. And uh, one of the things we forgot to mention before the game, when when they were lining up, I'm like, where's Aubameyang? And then, we, you know, one of the things we forgot to mention is, you know, he he was benched because I guess he showed up late to a team meeting. And, uh, you know, it's not the first time for him being late to a team meeting. And I think it sends the right message to the younger players in the team that you can't have that. You need to have discipline. And uh, I think it was the right thing to do. A quick thing, Mike, on that, your take on Aubameyang, the right thing to do, of course, I'm sure you're thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, that's the beauty of Mikael Arteta. You know, he's a no, no nonsense, no fuss guy. Um, I'm sure their rules are very, very strict. And if, it clearly shows you don't adhere. It doesn't matter who you are, you're out. Um, good thing that I, I don't know who, who was it. Lacazette who replaced him. I didn't see that actual start, but either way, I'm yeah. glad Lacazette played because he tends to have a habit of scoring in those games. So, um, and he played really well, um, which would have really uh, sent the message to his old mate Aubameyang while he was on the bench, freezing. They were. I think it was. Was it? Was it Gabriel that hit the post? He came through, I think uh, he hit either once or twice. I thought he played really well. Saka's pace, uh, Odegaard, of course, and Smith Rowe. Um, man, these guys, I'm telling you, um, really impressed. Next up was Manchester United, your team, Darren, at home to West Ham United, a Scott. Matomane header. I thought it was a bullet of a header. However, they did count it as officially as a Craig Dawson own goal. Um, I thought it was a, I thought it was a pretty even game. Manu dominated possession, of course. They had slightly more shots on goal, but for for West Ham, they were disappointing up front. They had a big fat zero on the amount of shots on target. Um, surprising. I think a deserved victory. Your take on the game, I'm sure you're happy to beat what's been a tough Man U side as of late. Yeah, I think we thoroughly deserve to win the game. West Ham didn't really show up. They've had a great season, you know, fighting towards getting that fourth place, which is an amazing achievement for a club like West Ham. But uh, no, United definitely deserve to win the game. Uh, dominated possession. Very impressed by Mason Greenwood. Thought he was a, a threat throughout. Um, and then McTominay makes himself awkward for the goal. It does go out off um, Dawson's, Dawson's head, head or his yeah. shoulders. Yeah, um, but no, job done. Um, the goal wasn't pretty, but uh, sometimes you just need to do the ugly goal to, to get the three points. Yeah, and you know what? And seeing the game through that you've commented in the last few broadcasts that we've had is that they haven't been like the old Ferguson teams at finishing off games. So the fact that they finish off West Ham, who have been on a tear lately. So great job there. Let's move on to the next game. Last up of the games on Monday was Wolves at home to Liverpool. It was a tight game in this one. And it came down to the one goal in the game. And of course, who did it have to be? But... Diogo Yota once again getting back into scoring form against his old side Wolves. I thought they got lucky. I thought Wolves had slightly more possession. Fairly even shot totals between the two of them. If it wasn't for that goal, I think Liverpool, they they pulled one out of the bag in, in my estimation on this one. What was your take on the game? Uh, do you think Wolves a bit unlucky to not come away with a point on this one, Mike? Um, yeah, I'd say so. Uh, it's it's another interesting game, isn't it? Um, Wolves have been challenging for a couple of years now, and and uh, as we know, they've had a a bad season this year um, for one reason or another. But they've always got the ability in them to to really challenge. Uh, obviously, coming against the weaker Liverpool this year, also, um, you know, I think there was Liverpool actually could have scored a few more. Yeah, they blew some chances, you're right. Yeah, 
So I don't think it was really fair to say that Wolves could have had a point. Um, they could have scored, but then Liverpool could, could have scored a couple more as well. Um, but, I mean, they've got to be happy, don't they? They're a win away from home, get away from the, the, the run of games at home where they were losing week on week, um, a win away in the Champions League. Um, I don't know, I think it was away. Um, and they're, you know, they're back to a little bit of form. But with Liverpool, we don't know this year, do we? Yeah, we don't. And it was a way. Um, but um, I have to say, um, another horror, because remember earlier in the season when Wolves were playing pretty well and then, of course, they lose their talisman to a absolutely horrific head injury due to a skull fracture. We had another almost not as severe, but it led to a concussion at least they're following concussion protocol, taking off the keeper. But Rui, when he went down, I was really, um, I was like, uh-oh, not a game. Not a game. Uh, I thought it was, I thought it was, I was hoping it wasn't another Jimenez incident with a skull fracture. But his own teammates collided with him, uh, I think, knee to head. And the Wolves keeper went down. And I was concerned. So I think that had a bit of an effect after he left play. What was your take on the game, Darren? Um, Wolves against Liverpool, and Liverpool needed those three points, yeah? I think Liverpool did deserve to win the game. Wolves had a few chances, but they were more half chances. Wolves always challenge the teams uh, who are in the, you know, the Liverpool's, Man City's, Man United's, uh, because they have so much athleticism. You know, Neves, uh, Traore, uh, a couple other players, they're just they're so quick, they're so fast on the counter attack, so they will always pose a danger. Um, but an outstanding goal from Liverpool, just the counter attack that they done between Mana, Salah, Salah, and Jota, yeah. uh, fantastic finish. Uh, Patricio probably beat that as near post. Yeah, won't be happy with that, and a real concern that that he got picked up that injury because. When you get hit at that pace, the goalkeeper is running towards the defender. The defender is running towards the goalkeeper. Um, and the way he went down at the end, lying on his back, he didn't look look great. So um, I know when I see that in a player, it's it's always a huge concern. Yeah, so uh, we, our thoughts are with Rui Patricio and his recovery. Um, it has been a long season for the Wolves players without that talisman, Jimenez. And now we hope it's not going to be too many games before we see Patricio back. Let's look at the tables, guys. We've got, at the end of this week, it's Man City, as we already said. They're in first place. 14-point lead over Man U. They've got 71 points in first place. Man U, 57. Leicester in third, 56. Chelsea in four, 51. West Ham still, believe it or not, in fifth place, 48 points. And Liverpool, having played 29 games, West Ham only 28 games played, in 46 points. Our teams, believe it or not, Arsenal has got 45 points. They're only one point behind, but they're in 10th place. So as a packed group, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. They're literally one point separating Liverpool in 6th place, 10th place Arsenal, and Leeds four points back in 41st place in 12th place. Before we leave, I wanted to uh, talk about some of the couple of topics that to do with the financial fair play rules that are being put in place, but also the idea of breaking away the top sides want to break away and form a Super League. And I wanted to get your takes individually on both of those areas and is it well needed that we get even more financial fair play rules to get some equalization between these sides that have billionaire owners that come in and they're competing against sides that are you know they're, they're multi-millionaires but they can't compete financially with the top sides like Manchester City to think that Leeds can compete in the transfer window the same as Man City or in Europe, like with a PSG. Um, let's give it to Darren first, and then we'll finish up with Mike. Uh, Darren, your take on both of those topics. 
Uh, I think with financial fair play, it's a topic that on one hand, it excites me when a huge billionaire comes on and wants to, I don't know, take Fleetwood Town into the Premier League, you know, or comes in and buys a Premier League team. And like Abramovich was the first to do it with Chelsea and uh, and then a few others have followed. So from a, from a player's and a fan's point of view, it's it really excites me. Um, is it fair on the lower team like a Leeds to, you know, it's financially they're on a different playing field. Um, but I would have to think more about it to to give a, a stronger opinion on it because how it should be regulated and what cap are you going to have? I, I don't know yet. I, I honestly don't. So. Um, I'll have to think about it more, but I know for me, um, I, I enjoy whenever like an exciting billionaire comes along and it's always fun for me. Yeah, well said. I think it is fun for the people that like attractive football. And of course, if you're a, a fan of the big top sides that have that deeper pockets, you want to see the best players in the world playing for your side. So I can't get away from that. I think financial fair play shows that, you know, what happened to the old leads back in the day where when we had Rio Ferdinand and we were in the, uh, we were in the Champions League semi-final and we were in the uh, UEFA League semi-finals within two years in a row. And then we went into administration some years later because we just overspent. Uh, I think having financial fair play rules that they've put in place now I think that's great, but I think more is needed. But like you said, where do you put the caps at? And that's a hard thing to determine. Mike, as a business owner, and you own a sports club yourself, maybe you could maybe contribute to the conversation in terms of how do you think they would manage that side of it? And then we'll go into, maybe you can comment first on the Super League as well, uh, the breakaway potential for that. And then we'll go back to Darren on that one as well. Yeah, well, you know, the, the in Australia, there's two things there. In, in the A-League in Australia, we have uh, caps. So you have uh, salary cap, you have spending caps, you have things you can do around that to, to entice uh, reward players, but you've got to be careful. There's rules around that. And it keeps it, we've had Melbourne Victory over here dominate for, for a lot of years and Melbourne, and sorry, in Sydney FC uh, also dominate. But you, this year, for example, Central Coast Mariners, who have been in the, the bottom one or two for the last five six years are on top of the ladder. On top of the ladder, wow. so it creates the opportunity for more balanced table. If that makes sense, yeah. um, in terms of the fixture, in terms of the capping in the National Basketball League in New Zealand, where I own a where I can't own a, a team there in Auckland, they have a, a ceiling and a floor um, minimums and, and maximum spends, so that no one falls through the, you know, falls through the floor, so to speak. About that, uh, uh, they bring back some of the wealthier teams that were, you know, bring in as many or the most expensive American imports as, ports as they could find to blow the league away. And wow. as a business owner, that has definitely helped because you're not, you're not trying to think, uh, compete on a budget that's unrealistic for you, putting pressures on your own team to go and get the corporate dollars and, you know, and, and fund it when it's not there and all of those sort of things. Um, but of course, the EPL is a completely different level in terms of, you know, a couple of extra details <laughs> on the end of all that. Um, you know, and it, it, it is almost impossible really for anyone outside of the top six to make constantly sustainably man, maintain a presence in the top six because of the sheer financial power of the city owners, the Manchester United owners, um, you know, uh, Liverpool is such a massive club. I mean, even Arsenal are, are notoriously spend thrift on players. Um, as an Arsenal fan, you often bemoan they, you know, don't really go in for the, not the big names, the established names, but the, the promising young people coming through. Um, I don't know where, where, where you set a parameter in that league with so much money at stake. It's a difficult one, but I would like to see something done to, you know, you can't just, drop a couple of billion and run away with the league year on year. I think that's boring. I don't think people really want to see that. Um, and the Super the, League? Sorry, the Super League's a different scenario because that's potentially being funded by JP Morgan. And oh. that's, you know, that's like a $6 billion fund. They're trying to entice the top tiered clubs from across Europe 
to play in a breakaway Super League. And then you have, you know, the harm that that's going to have on all of the, all of the other clubs in those leagues that just aren't even part of that conversation. Yeah, that would be devastating to the Leeds of the world unless they hold it off, you know, for a year or two and then maybe Leeds have a great, you know, spend in the in the summer market. Uh, what's your take on the Super League, Darren? Uh, the potential breakaway for that, I think obviously as a Man U fan, you maybe encourage it, but maybe you won't. I'm not sure. What's your take on that? Uh, I'm not a fan of the idea of it. Um, it doesn't interest me really. It, it would be exciting, but the Champions League um, is is sufficient enough to see teams from different countries facing each other. Um, the Premier League is a fantastic league. It's it's outstanding. Um, the German League is also brilliant. The Spanish League, I think that's the one that has the biggest gap between uh, between the leagues. You know, your Barcelona, Real Madrid, Atletico have a huge financial gap from the other teams. Whereas in the Premier League, anyone can beat anyone now. You know, it's it's quite it's quite balanced from from what I can see. Um, so I don't think that idea, I'll be very surprised, very surprised if that idea takes off. Um, because I mean, as a fan, I'm happy with how you, the structure of the Premier League and then you've got the Champions League. I don't think it's broke. I think it's great. Here, here. I think I'd like to see it stay the where it is, but maybe I'm, I'm biased on that. Partially as a fan, I'd like to see the Premier League stay the way it is. And of course, being a Leeds United fan specifically, I, I definitely am anti-Super League breakaway. Let's wrap up for this week. I do want to say that, guys, the listeners out there, if you want to tune in to, you can check us out on globalsportschannel.com. You could follow us on iTunes, on the podcast. We mentioned last week that Mike is heading up the Global Athletes Council, as well as we're all part of this effort to launch loveathletes.com. And we really want to put the athletes first. Mike, as we wrap up, give us a little bit about the Global Athletes Council, because all the listeners are fans of sports. We really want equity in sports. And how are you going to be part of that effort to bring more equality and more voice to the athletes and coaches in the world? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Well, you know, we all know that without athletes, there's no sport. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's gone so far the other way for such a long time. Um, that the sport is controlled by men in suits in ivory towers. Um, and we're not here to compete against that old regime. We're here to work in collaboration with every federation, club, association, event organiser, whoever it may be, to just say, hey, we've got a critical mass, which may be 90 to 95% of, of all of the world's athletes who aren't finishing their careers up like Ronaldo, Federer, Tiger Woods, you know, Shaquille O'Neal and these guys um, who have done exceptionally well. That's really not our, uh, our area. Our area is to say there's guys out there, you know, competing in triathlons. There's guys, there's swimmers, there's runners, there's, you know, I don't, every sport where you're out on your own, you're up early, you're funding your own way. And at the end of the day, you may just have a memory or if you're lucky enough, a medal to show for what you've done and, and a lot of debt you then have to deal with and no real life to move into. And that's an extreme example. And there's everything in between that and reasonably financially secure. But uh, the Love Athletes, I think, really looks after, will look after a lot of the, the ancillary services that people need, such as mental health care, such as financial health care, such as career opportunities and all of that sort of stuff. We're really about uh, being a voice for the collective of all the athletes that form the critical mass and saying, hey, what is it that you really need to be able to make your life more sustainable and more rewarding? Um, and how can we work in a collaborative way with every single uh, stakeholder in sports in the world so that everyone wins? That's really what it's all about. Beautifully stated, Mike. And, and, and I'd like the listeners out there to uh, really encourage, encourage to go to Global Sports channel.com and uh, look into the platform that we're forming called loveathletes.com that Mike mentioned, as well as the Global Athletes Council. 
and the formation of that. Wrap it up, Darren. I'd like to hear your take, your voice on the idea of the global, how important is the Global Athletes Council and how important is this platform, loveathletes.com? It's vital. It's a fantastic concept to provide support to athletes who are coming towards the end of their career. Um, I've seen it happen in a lot of guys in, in football who uh, don't have uh, that setup, you know, as Mike says, to walk into after their, their playing career is over because um, it doesn't last forever. So it's, it's vital. And if we can find a way to, to support these athletes, um, be it through education, through um, health and wellness, through um, career path, all those aspects are really vital um, because I think as a player, as an athlete, you, you are self-obsessed or you're not, you're obsessed with the sport. Actually, you, you know, you're in a kind of, you're in a very narrow tunnel because you have to be to be successful. So to branch out and think what you're going to do after is, is very important. Thank you. From two different perspectives, one as an athlete uh, and, and one as an owner, uh, as well as an athlete uh, outside the business world. Um, I think really I want to say thank you to both of you for another fine week. Love being with you guys. And um, hey, brotherhood, whether we are friends or not, we actually, this is a brotherhood because we, but we all of us, all three of us love sport and we believe in equality. And uh, I want to thank everyone out there for uh, tuning in this week. We'll see you guys next week. Appreciate the time, but. Thanks, David. Of course, we're all friends. Always, always. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Have a great week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, mate. Cheers, Mike. Cheers, Cheers Mike. Cheers, Darren.